How many ladies you know roll like this? Not many, if any. Jeez. I, I hope there's more. <laughs> anyway, Rochelle Potter, she's taken a multiple IUSA World Ripples, multiple New Zealand spearfishing records, but she's down to earth and insightful. Very cool to hang out with and go diving with. I had a real pleasure uh, meeting and diving with Rochelle and recording this interview on the back deck of a 60-foot commercial crayfish boat at the Three Kings Islands in New Zealand. Anyway, hello and welcome. My name is Isaac, a.k.a. Shrek, the host of the Noob Spiro podcast where we interview spearfishing experts, authorities and characters from around the world. Tune into um, their stories, lessons learned from years spent in the water. Rochelle was definitely uh, a great example of, um, of that and uh, huge lessons learned and shared in this interview. It's a really cool chat. Uh, but first, just want to quickly get into some shout-outs. A couple of podcast reviews, awesome. Uh, Nicola says, really enjoy the episodes. Good, actionable info and lots of shooting the poop. Brilliant. Uh, she's from Denmark, so that's pretty cool. Um, from noob to beginner, thanks to the new Spiro. Shrek and Turbo's podcast has not only cut the learning curve from noob to beginner, but also reignited the motivation to get back into spearfishing. Being a landlocked Spiro, the noob Spiro helps me stay motivated and reduces the learning curve by providing in-depth knowledge in an easy and funny format. Keep up the good work. Cheers for that, Stoffy. Um, also, the New Spiro Patreon page is still going off despite the COVID-19 drama. And uh, I'd encourage you, if you listen to the show all the time and you love it, become a patron listener at patreon.com forward slash noob spiro and uh, become a patron listener check out the page anyway there's uh there's a whole bunch of legends supporting the show every single dollar raise goes towards trips just like this one so thanks to the patron listeners also terrible time for some new merch but i've got three cool new shirt designs up at noobspiro.com forward slash mad gear girls with gills it's only for the ladies and uh Spent a little while nutting out the design for this. It's, I really like it. There's also Spiro Dad, um, based on a stereotype that um, some guys at the local Adreno store came up with about guys like me that walk in with Roman sandals or Crocs on and uh, love our spearing. Also, there's a Jobfish uh, tribute shirt that says, Do you even freedive, bro? Check out the designs at newspiro.com forward slash mad gear. But, um, yeah, hey, let's get into this interview with Rochelle Potter. It's fantastic. Some awesome things there, including her very own pulley roller system, which has allowed her to take out some massive uh, world record fish in excess of, you know, 100 kilograms. So let's hook in. Four strong reasons to shop at spearfishing.com.au. They have a price beat guarantee on any Australian price for spearfishing equipment if they stock it. $15 flat rate shipping across Australia. They've got a 30 day hassles free returns policy and you can save 20 bucks on every purchase over 200 by using the code new Spiro at checkout when you shop online. Added to that, if you order gear online, it arrives quickly. It's very well packaged. It's a literal no brainer if you're a Spiro in Australia. Shop at spearfishing.com.au. Use the code new Spiro and save. Just for you guys today, the legendary Noobers, aka the passionate listeners of the Noob Sphere podcast, Audible has a free audiobook download with a 30-day trial to give you an opportunity to check out their service. Now, I use Audible myself, so I've definitely got a couple of recommendations for you to check out today. Can't Hurt Me in 2019 made a huge impact on me. It's by David Goggins. He's a crazy unit. Um, it's probably the favorite book I read last year. I guess this story is all about going from wimp to warrior and most of the lessons in the book are about resilience and just getting back up. But it's one of those books that, that made the hairs on my neck stand up. I couldn't get enough of that book and I, I, th I think that's something that I'll listen to periodically over and over again. Another book on my reading list coming up is The Rise of Superman by Stephen Kotler. Uh, in the bio it says, drawing on it, over a decade of research and first-hand reporting with dozens of top action and adventure sport athletes like big wave legend Laird Hamilton, big mountain snowboarder Jeremy Jones and skateboarding pioneer Danny Way, Collar explores the frontier science of flow, an optimal state of consciousness in which we perform and feel our best. And, you know, if you are checking out the, the Audible trial, the free trial, you get one of these books for free. So check it out at noobspero.com forward slash audible. That's A-U-D-I-B-L-E. And uh, you could even get 99 tips to get better experience. I'll tell you what, you can't go wrong with that book. That is quality. 
Well, welcome to the Noob Spirit Podcast. Today is the single most idyllic um, surrounding I've ever had for a podcast. And uh, I've got Rochelle Potter, absolute treat today. Or is it Rochelle Davy now? What's the story? Yeah, uh, technically Davy now. <laughs> Just to throw a spanner in the works. So tell us a bit about that. So I've rolled up. Um, give us a bit of a background of this this trip we're on. Well, you know how you guys were supposed to get here on Friday initially mm. before flights and things got changed. Well, we figured that because we were planning on leaving at Friday lunchtime, that gave us all morning to get married. <laughs> so we booked it in and... We, but then your flights got changed, but we still got married in the morning. So we we, we just missed out on the ceremony. Pretty much, But we yeah. made it for the honeymoon. Yep, oh, here we are. Good. Is this your first honeymoon? or? <laughs> no, second honeymoon, but this one's better already. <laughs> uh, 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 nah, it's been um, fantastic. So we're out at the Three Kings, um, 50 kilometres north of um, sort of Cape Reinga, the, fa- the far north of New Zealand. I think you'll find those are miles. 50 miles? Mm. Shit. So, and we, we mowed it out from your place. Um, where are you guys situated? So we live in Doubtless Bay in the far north of New Zealand. And, um, yeah, we left there from Monganui was the port and uh, steamed up to North Cape and stayed the night in um, Tom Boland's Bay first night. You mm. guys went for an evening dive. Mm. How was that? Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't fantastic. Probably uh, the, quite dark. Yeah, and that was a bit, a little bit rugged, but it was good. It was nice to get in the water and yeah. get a dive under the belt. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it was good fun. Um, yeah, I'm loving this trip. It's been fantastic so far. Tomorrow we're uh, back in the water chasing big kingies again. Are you in the water with us tomorrow morning? What's the plan tomorrow? Yeah, probably. We'll see. Like, honestly, today it was just ridiculously rough. Like, mm. that was insane, and I didn't feel the need to be there. Yeah. I thought I'd just stay on the boat, so we had two sets of eyes on you from here. Yeah, because we yesterday was bad enough, and and to be honest, it was um, difficult to see you guys at times. So it was a lot better today having two of us on here. But, There's uh, been a couple of moments on this trip where I've had to like be on front of camera and try and describe it, and I've just found myself just at a loss for words. And that's it's, why it, that's why Kiwis are the way they are, mate. Because yeah. <laughs> everything's so stunning all the mm. time that we just go, yeah, it was nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we undersell it yeah. but it's like unless you're here you, you just can't describe it it's like jurassic park both above and below the water there's yeah. yep there's dinosaurs everywhere it's freaking crazy and the the islands themselves are just just real cool to look at i mean we're sitting here in a sheltered bay now and there's low low lying cloud it's just amazing there's birds wheeling and diving and we've had dolphins we've just shot a couple of snapper a lot of this place is so raw Mm. You know, it, it really doesn't give anything. It's not, um, mm. it's not a particularly nice place, but it's beautiful, mm. and uh, and it can be a lot of fun mm. as long as you're being safe. But um, it's the kind of place that can turn bad on you, and you can mm. probably appreciate that having seen what we saw the last couple of days. I hundred percent. This morning, like when you and Nat both stayed on the boat for safety, and then we worked in a team. Like it was, like despite the conditions being hectic, I, I don't feel. Like at like at significant risk at any stage of it. No, it no, was... you guys were fine, and we were confident you were going to be fine, and we checked that current and everything, and we had our plan in place that, say, the current did pick up too strong, mm. um, and and you felt at risk. We had that plan in place for um, how we can pick you up and and what we could do about it, what mm. our options were really. Mm. So um, yeah, it's just about being vigilant. Mm. So, like, you're a really interesting guest. Like, we've been, been, been going to have you on the show for ages. We've had your husband on, um, and you were very much always in line to, to get on the show. You, you hold a couple of world records. Um, you're sponsored by a, a famous French spearfishing company. I think I've got, um, Ed, don't quote me on this, I think it's um, eight world records. Eight world records. Women's world records. That's fantastic. It might be six. I can't remember exactly. Numbers aren't my thing. <laughs> and, um, and and I'm an ambassador mm. for um, for Boche Gear. Yeah. Yep. Um, largely by choice mm. because their 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 gear is awesome. And their rep and their representation of the for the sport of in New Zealand here is awesome as well. Fantastic. Yep. Yeah. Really great representation of the sport and really accessible. Great gear. Really accessible for everyone. Mm. So um, yeah, we're we're a big fan of both the brand and the R and D that they do and. Even down to, um, you know, the eco-friendly products that they, you know, neoprene and that, that they make their mm. suits out of, that sort of thing is um, is excellent in this day and age. We've just been interrupted. 
quite kindly by your husband, who's brought us out some power that is just, I think that's maybe the best power I've ever eaten. Um, is, is this something he does regularly? Is this why you married him? <laughs> just eat. <laughs> I think we call that, um, we should call that one, to be honest, this, we haven't had it quite like this before. Close, but um, I would call this one butter power. <laughs> oh, I'm loving it. I'm loving it. That's sensational. Everyone wonders that power or abalone is like really rubbery, but this is like, oh, this is just, I don't know. It's just freaking excellent. No, when it's done right, it's, um, it's tender as. Mm. We just blanch it mm. live straight into boiling water for a couple of minutes mm. then pull it out it'll fall out of the shell, the gut falls off the mouth just pinches out mm. and then uh, then this has been sliced thinly. It's more tender than steak and they're quite thick cuts there Yeah, it's been sliced thinly and then refried in a mixture of a lot of butter, flour and lemon so I guess power chips <clears throat> Power chips this is the best podcast ever. <laughs> uh, so a couple of your world records when you finish eating. Um, no hurry. Um, you've shot a couple of your world records up here. How many? From memory. Obviously, you've got the woman's world record for yellowtail kingfish, which was yep. and I got just that. shy of 50. Yep, just shy of 50. Uh, what did it go? 48.8 kilograms. Um, so that was that was good. That was a real goal. Like, I'd worked for a couple of years to get that fish. Yeah. And. So tell us tell us what happened there, because um, I've heard a little bit of the story, but I'd love to hear the whole lot of it. Who so it do- was rough. We, yep. were, we were out here in our small, in our stabby craft. 23 I think foot? it was 18 foot. All right. 18 and a half. And, um, yeah, 18 and 50 it was. <clears throat> so we'd been out here for, we were doing a three-day trip. It was the third day. And it had been rough. It had been choppy, rough, a lot of current. It had been hard going. And, yeah, we'd been diving. And the fish hadn't been, um, like, the kingfish hadn't been coming in shallow. You'd struggle to see them from the surface. You had to dive every time to see them. They were sitting down deep. Yep. So it was just all day trying to hold position in that current and dive. And um, we didn't know the spots as well then as we do now as well to target them. But yeah, it was just a lot of diving. And then towards um, the end of our time on that third day, I did a dive and the kingfish came in and, and I just saw one and it was really silvery. Like it wasn't a bright, uh, it wasn't a you know deep, dark coloured fish. It was quite silvery in that, but it seemed long and it seemed fat. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, I, I shot it. I thought, no, that's a, that's a good fish. I was trying to get a 40 kilo fish. Yeah. So I shot it, and we pulled it on board. Hang on, hang on. You've, sh- you've short-cutted me here. Oh. <laughs> so obviously you've pulled the trigger. Where, where was your shot on the fish, and um, um, what, what was your setup for the, for, to land a fish like The that? shot on the fish was, it was one of those hit-the-fish shots. It wasn't close enough for like a, a head shot or a, yeah. anything like that. It was um, pretty much aim at the petrol fin and try and hit the fish in a good holding shot. So I did that, and it took off, dragged my floats down, and started dragging me along, and it started dragging me towards this gut that was really messy. Mm. The, with the way the current was coming through and the swell and everything, and it was squeezing through this gut, it was really messy. It was, it was not nice at all. Mm. And we knew there was a lot of structure under there with rocks and things, and, and it, was the, it was pretty much the place to not go. And Nat, I, said, I put my hand up and yelled to Nat, fish on. So he was in the in the boat next to me watching, yeah. And uh, and it started the fish started going that way, to that gut, and he came over in the boat and he's yelling, you know, don't go through that gut, don't go through there. <laughs> I was like, well, what do you want me to do about it? Because <laughs> uh, yeah, I didn't have a lot of say over what was happening. I was trying to pull the fish off, but it, I couldn't. Yeah. I couldn't turn its head. So um, so we went through the gut, um, and we went through quite quick and just kind of held my breath most of the time and tried to hang on to the line and yeah it was all a little bit nautical but <laughs> she was all right at the end of the day she survived that eh? yeah that's crazy through there because you like the surge just jacks right up and then you got waves that are pumping through but then they're hitting 
swell bouncing off the walls and it's just yeah. a mess. Yeah, it's a mess and it's violent, you know, and you, you and you, you you're hitting into that those waves and that current and then airborne and yeah, yeah. So it's violent. It was only for a short time, and then on the other side. Um, so did it, did it pull you through quite quickly? Yeah, we did go through quickly because that was the current was also pushing through there as well. Oh yeah, yeah. And but it was like right next to this rock and everything. It was you know I was trying to avoid it. It was it wasn't very cool, mm. but um, survived. And at the other side, you know, fought the fish a little bit more and managed to pull it in. And towards the end there, it got quite tired and I was able to pull it up a bit faster. And I was really really careful when I got it to me because. You know, if it if it decides to have one last thrash, yeah. there goes my mask and snorkel, and yeah, yeah, yeah. you know it can really do some damage. And um, the fish is bigger than you are, like it, that, yeah, that, like lengthwise it was taller than me. Yeah, yeah, and it's real powerful. Like it's fighting for its life. Maybe so. maybe seven or eight kilos lighter than you too, probably. Yeah, I was in, I was nearly sixty kilos, and it was and fifty it's kilos. Nearly fifty kilo. <laughs> so it's a friggin' amazing. Yeah. Like I had a twenty-seven kilo one on yesterday, and this thing would have taken me to school, and it was literally like half the size of yours. I'm just like, yeah, holy it's... moly, you didn't have an easy go of it. No, I mean it was, but big fish generally they're not easy, you know. Yeah, a yeah. real big fish like that, like that record stood for a few years and and um, it was a hard one to achieve mm-hmm. both to actually find the fish and get the shot and, yeah. and it was a hard fight and and I like to earn those big fish. So you got it up to you and yeah. then what did you go for, straight for gills? Um, yep um, I was pretty wary but I got it up to me yep and I think I went for the gills or and a solid wrap like get it upside down and get my knees over it and, and really trying to lock it up so that it um, that it didn't feel like it could get away, you know. I didn't want it. I didn't want it to be upright and, and trying to swim off. So yeah. yeah, get it upside down, and yeah, then get a hand in the gills and, and get your knife in there real quick. Yeah, yeah. And um, and try not to stab yourself. Stab yourself. Try not to get caught in the line. Just the head it, size on that fish must have been huge. Yeah, it was huge. Yeah, it was good. And it was a really long fish. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, I think it was actually longer than Nat's um, Nat's world yeah, record yeah, he fish. Said that. Yeah, he did say that by like eight centimetres or something. Yeah, yeah. So if that if your fish was like maybe a little bit fatter or is a little bit younger maybe or who knows, it could have um Yeah, I think my fish was probably younger. Okay. And um Yeah, Just if it had a... been a little bit fatter it would have been, you know, a mm. real ripper. As if it wasn't It's still a ripper. <laughs> Gee, what a massive fish. That's that would have been special. Um so all this spear fishing must have started somewhere. Um I, I'm, I've been privy to some of your background. How did it all start the water for you? Oh, it all started. Um, I always loved swimming, whether it was in the pool at home or um, in the ocean. I always loved swimming, so started scuba diving in my late teens, early twenties. But um, I found the gear pretty cumbersome, so on my way out to buy a buy a new scuba wetsuit one day, I popped into a, a shop and walked out with a Picasso freediving wetsuit yeah that was it I never looked back yeah, yeah, yeah it was all on from there and I think the next Christmas I bought an underwater camera because mm. I needed something to do I was spending all this time swimming around and mm. I didn't like the idea of shooting fish just really wasn't my cup of tea at the time so um and you and you think that camera was a CNC well it was a CNC housing yeah oh okay yep yep or something do you know I really can't quite remember but mm. I know that i took a lot of really bad photos with that <laughs> and I was like well I'm no good at this so I still need something to do with my time so I picked up a spear gun and I went out one day and I was out by myself and I shot a perori mm. and I took it back and gutted it and filleted it and ate it my brother and I ate it cooked it up for tea and it was it was good actually it was yeah, nice yeah. Yeah. and I thought oh well you know, I, I didn't like the part where I pulled it in and I had to stab it in the brain and it was <laughs> looking at me in the eyes and, yeah. you know, it was all, it felt pretty brutal. It didn't yeah. feel nice that first time. But at the end of the day, I actually really, really liked going out and f- choosing what fish I was going to shoot mm-hmm. and filleting it and eating it. I loved that that choice, that mm. option, yeah. I guess we grow up a little disconnected from our food and from having to actually kill it and stuff. And it's like... It's a bit of an ethical thing. Um, so for you, was that part of it, reconnecting, and then after that it was just sort of rolled on through and you appreciated it more and more? Yeah, very much so. Like, once I did that, it didn't feel good to kill the fish, but it felt right, like mm. the right thing to do to, to hunt and harvest 
your own food, especially diving and, and spearfishing, because you're out there in their element. Mm. You're not good at it. You know, like, you need a wetsuit and you've got these fins on, and if you do everything wrong, then the fish will swim away from you. Mm. <laughs> so there's a lot to overcome to get yourself in the position to shoot a fish, mm. um, and especially some of those desirable fish like, say, a snapper in New Zealand, they're pretty wily. Mm -hmm. um, so that that becomes the fun of the hunt and mm. everything. But yeah, I really connected with that that yeah hunting and gathering process rather than buying it at the supermarket. So probably there there be young women listening to this interview. I hope and they might be inspired. Um, were you like a, a tomboy growing up? Was um, we you know like obviously spearfishing can be perceived as a bit of a bloke sport what do you say to that and to say people you know like the, the young women that think about it oh just if you like it do it mm. i don't care what someone else thinks about what i do mm. nice so um yeah I, I was a bit of a tomboy growing up i was sporty i loved being outside and riding bikes and and that sort of thing but um i didn't get to do diving swimming in the pool was you know how i grew up Mm. Uh, but not actually diving in the sea and and seeing the fish and that. But um, no, I reckon if you like it and you're interested in it, go for it. Yeah, yeah. There's no reason not to. And sure, there's people out there that disagree with what I, what I do um, with shooting fish. And, and I hunt outside of that, shoot deer and, mm. and things for our food. In fact, we, um, we hunt and or grow all our own food. So we have sheep at home and... And we go hunting for deer and, and mm. spearfishing for fish. So we don't buy any meat um, oh, protein. And, yeah, there's people out there that, that and even friends who don't agree with what we do. Yeah, right. But then again, I don't necessarily agree with what they do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so each to their own. And yeah, if you're interested in it, go for it. So you, have you always been like that? How did you get this attitude where you just didn't give a shit? Oh, I think I grew up a bit. Yeah. I probably used to care a little bit more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, not so much anymore. Yeah, nice. It's freeing, isn't it? Yeah, well, it's how it should be. Mm. Yeah. So no, You told good. me a cool story about uh, one of your underwater adventures that began um, before you were perhaps ready for it. <laughs> uh, something to do with a scooter, whatever there. You want to tell that story with your brother? At a new house or something in the swimming pool. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh! When it, long story short, when I was two, I dragged my little uh, plastic scooter trike round to the back lawn where it wasn't supposed to be, and hopped on and rode it down the hill into the pool <laughs> in the middle of winter. And I was two years old. And, and then your mum fished you out. Yep. Thank goodness for that leaf scoop. <laughs> That's funny, awesome. Now, I'm, I'm surprised we were chit chatting away, but it didn't seem to leave any sort of lasting damage. You, you were never scared of the water, and, and that plays well through into today. Um, some of this gear you're rocking, um, the wetsuits, they're really comfortable for women, um, and, yeah. and obviously, men, Nat loves his suit. Um, what's with the orange feature on the hood in the back? I think it's quite neat. Yeah, so I find that that. It's a, the one I wear is a Boshar Roxy suit and it's five mil and it has we um, prefer the safety spot that has the big orange star over the hood and on the back and that has been uh, pretty much a life saving feature for us in some of these envir environments where we jump in and it's, um, and it's really rough or it gets really dark mm. um, that safety spot really stands out and especially when you've got something like a with some of the work we've done where you've got a, a Spiro and then you've got a um, cameraman yeah, and the cameraman's following them around but they don't have a float to, to show where they are. Oh, yeah. And so um, that safety spot has been fantastic for seeing that person. And if you do a comparison, you know, if you have one person with that safety spot on and another diver that doesn't, that just has a normal camo or black mm. wetsuit, like the, that person is virtually invisible whereas yeah. the safety spot is really visible from yeah, the nice. surface and especially when you put your head up and look around so they're so, up to a winner with those suits eh? well yeah absolutely it's an Warm, experience. comfy and, and good for visibility as well yeah fantastic visibility and even underwater when it's quite dark mm -hmm. um, yeah they're, they're awesome but just don't leave them out in the sun when they dry when you're drying them dry them in the shade because otherwise they do fade mm. now um you went out and you, you actually caught these powers that were eating. Um, 
and you've had a, had a couple of cracks um, with some commercial diving as well. What's that? What are those experiences like? Oh, um, hard. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like you work your ass off. Yeah, I don't think uh, you could ever have told me that I was going to, when I turned 40, I was going to become a commercial diver. <laughs> I would have been, nah. <laughs> I don't think I would have believed you, but no, it's happened. And um, we kind of enjoy it. I do enjoy it, but it's definitely hard work. Like, it's not like going recreational diving. Mm. You know, you'll do oh, 10 times as many dives in a day. Um, if not more, when you're commercial diving versus when you're recce diving. So, what sp- what species are you targeting? Uh, Blackfoot power and kinna. So we've done we've we've covered a bit of terrain. So we've done a little bit of like almost like open blue water stuff in terms of chasing yellowtail kingfish. Then there's snapper snooping here. There's uh, all sorts of different style hunting. Um, if you had to choose one species to target and what, which, what, what species would you choose and how do you sort of hunt them effectively? Oh, one of my favourites is definitely snapper snooping. Okay. So when, with your snapper, just for a, for a fun day out, um, with your snapper you can either set a burley or you can try and snoop along ledges and, and guts and, and try and spot them and, and shoot them. And that's mm. my preference. And that's the, really, the real hunting side where... You know, you've got to do everything right. And mm. if you don't, you just hear that bang or you see that tail taking yeah. off into the distance and <laughs> you know that you got it wrong again. The uncanny animal. <laughs> but, uh, but when you do succeed, it feels great. Yeah, so I'm, I'm a big fan of snapper snooping. Um, Nat loves his burlies mm-hmm. and that, but, yeah, not my cup of tea. Do you find much crossover from hunting on land to hunting in water? Oh, very much so. Like, especially um, I went for a solo hunt one day and, and shot a chamois down on the west coast of the South Island and uh, I can only describe that stalk as my best snapper snooping. Yeah. So I usually um, hold the gun midway along, hold the rubbers and the, and the barrel and uh, yeah, that way I can sort of control the ends and, and that I've, I really, when I'm sneaking down and that, I really hold it by the handle because it can get caught in the weed or mm. or something. So I usually hold it mid-gun until I'm closer to where I'm ready to take a shot. And then, um, yeah, then I'll reposition, hold the handle and, and you know, push the gun out. Mm. But, yeah, a lot of the time when I'm swimming or uh, or diving down, like when we were diving down here earlier to these weed lines, mm. I prefer to hold the gun in the pretty much in the middle I find it's um, I can hold it in nice and close to my body and and just get less drag for that efficient descent so it's efficiency and it's sort of um, minimizing noise and opportunities to bang it as well yeah okay there's really like honestly there's no wrong way of doing it if Mm. you prefer holding the handle all the time I used to do that and and that's fine I just found that that uh, especially with snapper it would get caught up in the weed more doing Mm. it that way yeah okay but yeah there's there's no wrong way. It's no, I think I do it like you, but I'm just not as stealthy. <laughs> it's me, just a bit more clumsy. To be but fair, around here, you probably weren't expecting to see Snapper as well. Yeah, but then when I saw the first one, I thought, oh, okay, they're around, so I should have been more onto it, but I just, yeah, wasn't. But, you know, like, I think multiple trips doing the same sort of stuff, you do, you do, you learn tricks, and that's part of the, you know, why I dug into this on the, in the podcast as well with you. So, yeah, cool. I've never heard of a spearfishing business where you could say, crikey, mate, to save some money. But nevertheless, here's a first, as usual, on the No Spiro podcast. Head into Killshot Spear Guns. They're in Ismarada in the Florida Keys. You can save $30 on a Killshot Spear Gun or 10% off freediving classes through to April 1st. Check it out, Killshot Spear Guns. Guys, when it's time to upgrade your fins, you want to buy something that you won't kick yourself for in five years. And I've been wearing my the same set of penetrator fins for four, five years. And I'm not the only one. Uh, legendary Australian Spearer Ian Puckridge wears them, freediving record holder Ben Eckhart and Hawaii's Justin Lee. There's a whole host of Spearers that love and use penetrator fins. Check them out at penetratorfins.com. If you want to purchase, use the code NoobSpero for a limited time only. You'll save $25 on any purchase. Check it out, penetratorfins.com. Have you had any, like, really scary moments in the ocean? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yep. 
I got chased out the water by bull sharks that were <laughs> that were fighting over who was going to eat me first over in <laughs> Western Australia. That was oh. probably my closest to getting eaten um, um, experience. And then, yeah, we got pushed out by a, a big tiger shark in Atataki. And then we had some real, um, yeah, pretty feisty shark experiences over in Ascension Island. Mm. Um, although Nat got a, a cool video on his head cam of one of those. And we didn't realise how serious it was at the time, but in hindsight, looking back at the footage, it was um, it was quite full on. And, and I ended up, about a year later, I got round to putting that on YouTube with a bit of music, and it, it went, went viral. viral. Yeah. So, yeah, we got a lot of hate for that. I'll yeah. link that video up. Like, there's a few... Um, how armchair. dare you stab that shark? Yeah, say, yeah. How many times do you want to slap it away with his hand? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what ends up happening in that sequence? Um, so Nat was trying to shoot a, um, a small yellowfin tuna with his pole spear mm. and uh, I hadn't quite got in the water yet, I was mucking around with my camera and I just wasn't quite ready so he got in first and the other two guys got in and then I was getting ready to get in but he was too quick, he'd already um, dived down and shot this small tuna with his pole and he didn't see the sharks that were in the background yep. at that time, he was just concentrating on the fish so he shot the Oh, he'd missed it the first time, and I think the sharks must have come up at that, and he reloaded while he was still underwater, as you can with a pole spear. And, and then he shot the fish the second time, but the sharks were pretty much right there on him. And uh, so he had a bit of a battle. He didn't really want to lose the fish to the sharks, and he didn't want to damage his, his gear, his slip tip and that on his pole because he didn't have a spear. Yeah. So um, he his intention was to just fend them off, mm. like we've had lots of shark encounters before and usually you can just sort of fend them off a wee bit and they'll move away but yeah. these guys were real feisty and it got a, a little bit more intense than Nat had expected and then one of them got a um, it took a bite of the fin of the tuna mm. and that was it that was frenzy from there on it got mm. really out of control but at that by that point Nat was actually a little bit tangled in his line and he dropped it all dropped the fish and the, all the gear and tried to get untangled and the sharks were confused by then and they were coming up and actually pushing like harassing him and pushing into his stomach and sort of trying to bite him and stuff so he was slapping them away with his hands and then uh, he realised he needed to you know take a bit more control because more sharks were turning up yeah so um, he got his knife out and he pulled the fish in to, to icky it, mm. to stop it from, you know, vibrating and, and that in the water. And the sharks came in, so he stabbed the shark and stabbed the fish. And then the other shark came in and he stabbed that. And <laughs> he didn't have another problem after that. <laughs> yeah, it, was, it all happened real fast and uh, got captured on his head cam. But those sharks were just fine. We saw the same ones the next day. They were yeah. pretty identifiable. They both had a big white, you know, scar in their head. But they were perfectly okay. It's amazing what fish and sharks and, and mammals in the ocean can heal. Oh, like yeah. You see net wounds, you see, yeah. I've seen spear wounds on, on, on fish that have, been, that have escaped, luckily, yeah. a bit more cagey the next time. And I, I guess those sharks are the same, they heal over. Sometimes it's good to disincentivize any further action. I think, you, like you said, like take control of the situation. Yeah, yeah. It just, you know, that one just escalated um, real fast. Mm. And by then it was too late to really avoid it. So, you know, you got, you got yourself in this situation. So he got himself out. Yeah. So with sharks and like when their, their body language just gets a bit intense, like you've been chased out of the water a few times, is that, w when do you make that call? Oh, it's just a feeling. There's a feeling you get when you swim with all the sort of fish and sea creatures, whether it's whales or, or sharks. I just, get, I just go on my gut feeling. Yeah. You know, you get. Sometimes you you'll be in swimming along and and whales we've had whales come up to us and it feels really cool it feels really fun and mm. and really nice and then other times we've been on whale watching trips and you get in the water and you get this feeling like that whale's not happy it's it's harassed mm -hmm. and it's like well we shouldn't be here you know we should get out that's not a happy whale and and same with sharks you can have them swimming around and watching and stuff and and it feels okay. Um, you watch them for a while, but it feels okay. But then, as soon as you feel like it's not okay, then yeah, do something. Yeah. yeah. Get out of the water, or it's hard for um, new people though who don't have that sense of intuition because <laughs> they haven't spent much time in the water with sharks. They they see one and they freak out. 
So it's kind of sometimes you've got to get earn those miles with them, don't you? Yeah, for sure. Like the first time I saw one, I was I didn't freak out, but I wasn't I wasn't cool with it. Mm-hmm. I watched that thing, kept my eyes on it, and then I didn't feel comfortable, so I got out of the water. And yeah. then soon after, I saw another one. And you build up experience, and if you're not comfortable, just get out of the water. Yeah, yeah nice. Yeah, nice. Um, being in a group helps too. I think with sharks too, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely. Yep. They make you. They can make you feel more confident, and and I think the sharks, if they sense a united front, they're a lot more. They stay further down the water column. Absolutely. Like we've done lots of. Um, we've done a lot of support work, like buddy work, where someone's hauling in a fish, and you'll dive down, and just be a presence in the water to keep the sharks away, mm. and that's been really effective. Um, but it's also a balance between putting yourself between the shark and the food Mm -hmm. so you know again it's got to be something you're confident with and and go with that gut feeling and and if it's not the place to be then get out yeah Mm. so you've been you've been spearfishing for quite a while um in those early days when you encountered encountered obstacles and struggles and stuff as all of us do what was your go-to for sort of um figuring your way out of it or figuring out how to overcome it can you remember any of them Oh, not really. <laughs> not really, eh? You just muscle through it. A lot of people forget nah. some of the scars and war wounds of learning, like oh, whether just... it's equalising or it's hunting technique or it's uh, free, you know, free diving fitness, like in terms of breath hold. Yeah, I think certainly with uh, learning to spearfish and that, I just spoke to other people and would go out with other people on their boats and and you know pay my share of the gas and mm. and get in there with other people and, and try and learn from them. Mm. That, was, that was the best way. Um, but I was quite fortunate. I'd been spearfishing for about four years, but then I went and did my um, SSI freediving instructor course. Yeah. And through doing that, and then um, I ran, um, I was an instructor teaching freediving through one of the Auckland spearfishing shops. Okay. And that was really good fun. Yeah. yeah, and I learned heaps doing that about um, your own confidence in the water and, mm. and the confidence of others and, you know, a lot of that equalising. It's amazing how much you learn about yourself when you have to teach someone else. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, so I learned heaps through that and, and from that, you know, I've just, I just do what what I'm good with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did, did, did you have any, like, um, standout sort of influ- influences or, or mentors with your spearfishing? Was it very much just like a pick a bit here, pick a bit there kind of yeah, thing? Yeah, just pick a bit here, pick a yeah. bit there, and and um, yeah, go dive regularly with with some people for a while, and then they might move away or do other things, and so you yeah, go and meet some other people, and I met some people on online like spearfishing forums um, or through shop uh, club nights and mm-hmm. things like that. Yeah, so mm. just round the trips. How, what's your experience been with sort of like international spearfishing community? Have you had mostly good interactions? Have you had mixed bag? Have you um, sort of what what stands out for you? Like you've done a lot of travel as well. Spearos are an interesting bunch wherever you go. Oh, look, every Spiro is the best Spiro that you're ever going to come across pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, no, I take that back, Isaac, because no, you're, you're a good dude. But oh, it's because I'm... It's because I'm not very good. <laughs> <laughs> I reckon um, the international spearfishing community, like I reckon people are real enthusiastic and passionate about spearfishing. People mm. love it, you know, and there's so many different ways to approach it. You can have different gear, you can have uh, like different wetsuits and fins and guns and setups and little things here or there mm-hmm. that you've learned or mm. um, you know, little nuances that um, sort of everyone in Australia approaches it this way and everyone from the States approaches something that way or something. So you get your little sort of international nuances about mm. things but mm. overall the community is really enthusiastic generally really supportive yeah. and um, yeah we've we've met some really cool people traveling um, around the world and through spearfishing mm. yeah it's been awesome um, I want to come back and maybe talk a little bit about some of your trips but um, one thing I noticed just diving with you briefly um, is that you, you seem super relaxed like chilled, whether you're on the bottom, whether you're on the surface, whether you're moving, whatever it is you're doing, you seem very relaxed and in your space. Is that something you've cultivated? Is that something you've learned over time? Yeah, definitely. I used to be way more excited and excitable (laughs) about spearfishing, but um, 
these days, like I always try and have a plan about every dive, what I'm doing. So while I'm on the surface breathing up, I'm thinking about what I'm trying to achieve with my next dive. So if I can see a rock and it's like, right, I'm going to dive down and, and hold on to a bit of weed on that rock and then I'm going to, um, you know, hold my change my grip on my gun and I'm going to sneak forward, I'm going to look over that oh. ledge and and that. and, and Or if it's um, a weed line, it's like, right, it's going to be 20 seconds down to that weed line and then I'm going to swim around for 10, 20 seconds, um, see what I can see, you know, lie on the bottom, flick up some sand and then it's going to be 20 seconds up and, you know, so I've got a plan and uh, and that just takes a lot of the guesswork out and that helps me to be more relaxed. Yeah, right. Eh? So uh, when I'm back on the surface, I just have to just have a bit of a breathe up and then plan what I'm doing next time. What happened that time? Was there a terakee down there or not? Should right. I swim to the next weed ledge or um, or am I going to go in close and do something else over there? Or mm. you know, so I try and have a plan and uh, and not get too overexcited. I'd like to try and be. Yeah, real calm and try and encourage the fish to come close. I think with your approach, you could probably make very small improvements over time that you probably haven't even noticed that you've made. Yeah, most definitely. Yeah. Like um, One of them would be the way I use my fins and the way I like to, um, to kick. Whether it's um, if I need to go somewhere fast then you know keep my legs straighter and and really sort of power long long straight legs powerful strokes yeah or whether i have you know quite happy and i'm just sort of cruising let my knees bend a little bit more or if i just want to quietly just um move across the bottom over to there whether i just flick my um feet Mm. Just my ankles gently and just flick the fins to get a little bit of momentum going yeah. before I start trying to kick because I don't want to have to do a big scissor kick to get myself moving. Yeah, I want to yeah. start that momentum first. Less alarming as well. Yeah, yeah, so that I'm not sort of spooking fish and um, and things. So I know that's one thing I've learned over time um, and that's been through trying out different gear and, and finding something that works for me and that's why I love uh, the fins that I have so much because mm. it, that, that technique works mm. but yeah there's just lots of things and I'm sure everyone finds that the more they do the more they learn and the more comfortable they get with what they've got and, and if you find sometimes you find that what you've got isn't what you want you might want something different but generally you want to know why you want something different yeah, you, yeah. you know if you're not happy with your gun what is it that you want it to do differently you know before you just go out and buy a new one because it's fandangled um, gun loading is a huge um, issue for 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 people yeah, um, yeah. For, for for blokes and for for women yep um, it's a lot of upper body strength and it's really painful in your chest if you haven't got a good loading pad and then sometimes if you're using a longer length it's a sort of a, a two or a three stage process um, I've noticed that you and Rosie who you've taught and uh, she's a beast by the way um, in the water she's you know she's been going four years and yeah she's she, a real I was good telling diver her, I think she's um, more dive fit than at least 80 percent of my dive buddies <laughs> and uh, you know but she's using this big um, double roller and it's got a really neat pulley system on it um, is that something you guys come up with yeah so I developed that pulley system um, I mean that's what we used to use in, back when I did sailing as a kid was a purchase system to make it um, so you were able to pull in the rope mm. um, so I had a purchase system on my main sheet and, and my vang on my boat when I was a kid and when it came to spear guns, uh, the number of times guys gave me their gun and they're like, here, here, load this one. It's real easy. And I couldn't load it. Yeah, yeah. I didn't, it didn't matter what I did, I couldn't load it. And I used to work out at the gym and do all these exercises to drive yeah. me stronger <laughs> to load big guns because I wanted to shoot big fish. Yeah. And if you want to shoot big fish, you need power. Yeah. The, you cannot substitute power when it comes to big fish, even big kingfish. Um, you need that shaft to penetrate right through the fish and mm. to hold, you know. And I'm not out there to try and to to take bad shots, and and hope, or to shoot a fish with an underpowered gun and hope that it holds. Mm. You know, I really want to get the maximum power that I can muster um, when I so that I, when I choose to take that shot, I know it's going to be you know pretty much go right through. So uh, well, I developed a, a purchase system that I put on my double roller. Um, gun, and yeah, it's it's got a heap of grunt. 
So then we had to do things like upgrade the uh, the shaft to a heavier shaft yep. uh, to make sure that it didn't flex too much when it was firing out of the gun. And that, but it's it's awesome. It's really powerful. So what are you what are you using? An eight mil, seven point five mil? Uh, I think it's an eight mil shaft. Yeah, right. Eight point one. And those yeah. those bands look look pretty bloody. Uh, look, it's a rigid ditch setup. Like I had a bit of a play today because um, I give Rosie the real gun to have a go, and I was just having a look at it, and I was like. Just trying to figure out how it all worked. Cause I know it, it looks complex and it and it doesn't look that cool, but at the end of the day, I can load my gun and Rosie hers, um, and we can get really really good power, so we can shoot those big fish mm. with confidence. Mm. And that's what the difference is. Um, even though it's it's a little bit of a hassle, mm. um, it's a little bit of mucking around, but it's not too bad. You can still load it fast, and uh, and yeah, it's it's good. It's powerful. Yeah. Awesome. It's funny the little tweaks people do to their gear. Like obviously looking at looking at your gear, I was thinking, oh, yep, there's a few there's a few significant changes you've made with your gear over the years. It's a clever little um, thing with the rollers there. Yeah, um, it was, if it wasn't that, it was that we had to have lots of bands, or um, you know, there's other ways to compensate, but that's the way I've chosen to mm. do it because it also means that Nat and I can share guns. Mm. So um, when we travel, if we take say two guns. Mm. As long as we have that system on it, he doesn't need it, right? Yep. He's strong enough to, to load them mm. without it. Mm. But um, when it's my turn, I can still load those same guns. Mm, 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 yeah, mm. and not have a problem. So any gun, any of our guns, if I'm shooting a world record fish and I need a second gun and someone throws it to me, if as long as it's one of our guns, I know that I can load it. Mm. Whereas if um, if I can't load it myself, then I'm, it's not valid for a world, the fish can't mm. be valid for a world record. So I have to be able to load our guns. So that's one of the other reasons, mm. is it gave us that versatility. Six or eight world records, it smacks of premeditation, uh, thinking long and hard about which records to take and when to take them. Nah. Uh, nah? <laughs> no way. Oh, wow. Okay. Some of them I didn't know they were world records till we got back to the to the way station and oh, Googled wow. it. Oh, yeah. And um, do you guys lodge through iusa or through um obviously there's the new zealand spearfishing records as well yep yep i think i've got 16 um or had 16 new zealand spearfishing women's records oh wow yeah and then um our world records we put through iusa yep 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 yeah is that process easy enough yeah it's pretty good yeah it's pretty good it takes a little bit of time though. Yep, you've just got to allow time. You've got to make sure you um, get the right photos and measurements yep. and evident like photos of the measurements and all of that uh, done when, you, when you're weighing in the fish. And so if you go somewhere on a trip and you shoot a really cool fish, like before you go on the trip, it's a good idea to know where you're going to weigh your fish in. Yep. Where is there a set of certified scales yep. that you can weigh in on? Or if there is no set of certified scales, find out what your options are um, to still make your world record valid. There are other op options. Yep. And then make sure you know what um, yeah, measurements and photos and things you need to take and make sure you get them. And then after that, it's just um, the time it takes to submit it online, which is not arduous. It's just a matter of allowing enough time to sit down and, and work through that process. Hey Shrek here, sorry I missed you. Leave me a message. Oh, hey Shrek man, how how are things going over there at the uh, the world's best spearfishing podcast? Things over here at the world's best spearfishing magazine are fantastic, and uh, man, you've had some some awesome episodes lately i've really been enjoying the podcast so keep that up man i just want to let uh the noobers know that um spearing magazine have got a range of apparel and uh we've got some really cool gear uh you know about it dude but like we've got snapback hats and shirts and stuff and the brand is off the off in the face like by Spearing Magazine, there are some uh, some cool gear. You can get uh, like like magazines and some gear as well. Just check it out at uh, SpearingMagazine.com. But keep what you're doing, doing what you're doing, man. Um, really loving it, and uh, let's keep moving on this year, man. Awesome stuff. The Noobs Bureau, Spearing Magazine, Jeremy Gamble. I'm out. Catch you, bro.
just conscious of time and my fading batteries on our recorder. <laughs> but I know one of your massive passions is photography and some of your images are fantastic. I really want to link up some of them in today's show notes. So if people go to noobspira.com forward slash Rochelle, um, R-O-C-H-E-L. E. E? No double L. Okay. Cool. No, just one L. Just one L. <laughs> All right. And then um, I'll try and link up a couple of your images in there and people can come and find you and stuff. And obviously there was the YouTube videos as well. But um, the photography started early for you, like pretty much just before spearfishing, was it? Yeah. And it was a massive failure at the time. I just didn't know how to work a camera. And I assumed that the camera was um, set up for underwater, which it wasn't. So it was a total failure. And I didn't try again until... Uh, probably 10 years later mm -hmm. when I was heading off on a wicked trip out to the Wanganella Banks and I ha happened to catch up with a mate and he happened to have a second hand camera, camera for sale and I happened to buy it <laughs> and then I haven't looked back from there yeah, it's, it's awesome I love taking photos yeah yeah, yeah. yeah it's cool um, have you refined your craft over the years is it, is it a little bit like you're diving you, you, you sort of think about a shot or yeah, a massively. shoot and then you make little tweaks and you plan things out? Yeah, I really try and think about um, what angle I'm trying to take on the on the shot, what's going to make the fish look good or um, sometimes it's just a matter of actually getting it. Mm. Like when a school of skipjack tuna come blasting past you real fast, like can you actually get a photo out of yeah, that? Yeah, you know, yeah. that's, the, that's the number one goal. It's a little bit like when you start out um, spearfishing, you know, rule number one aim at the fish, shoot the fish. <laughs> I don't care if you shoot it in the head or in the tail, <laughs> just yeah, try and shoot the fish. The fish. Um, and the same with photography, you start out like, get the fish, on, uh, get a shot of the yeah. of the fish or whatever it is and then and then refine from there. So I'm, I think a lot more now about when I'm taking a, a photo, I'm all automatically thinking about angles and uh, water clarity and distances and what's in the background and heaps of stuff. How fast they're moving, how much yeah. light you got over here. Yeah. There's so yeah. much to Have it. Have I got time to adjust my settings or not? Yeah. <laughs> Have I still got any breath left? Yeah, yeah. Some some people seem to be able to get obsessed about, as obsessed about underwater photography as they are about spearfishing. You seem like you're one of those people. Yeah, definitely. Like, I, I still find it hunting. It's definitely hunting. Trying to get that amazing shot of a snapper in the wild, like mm. outside of a reserve or anything like that. Mm. It's not easy. Yeah, no. And, uh, yeah, it, and fish, again, they don't generally, they don't swim right up to you and just hold still and pose for a photo. So <laughs> getting a, a really top photo of something um, is cool. Yeah, Especially yeah. something that happens randomly, like when, when whales just swim up to you out of the blue and you just happen to be in the right place at the right time. You know, that stuff's awesome. When you're in a place like the Three Kings, um, it's very hard to describe this place, I think, to other people. You know, like, and as good as modern day cameras are and photos and stuff, sometimes it, I still don't, they still don't capture it, do they? Nah. No way. Yeah. I mean, I took probably a thousand photos today yeah. of waves hitting rocks and and that, and I've sort of sifted like loosely through a few of them, and yeah. and I don't feel I captured it. Yeah. No, uh, I didn't quite capture it right. It feels so much different when you're seeing it all happening in mm. action, but uh, I haven't quite got that photo yet. And the sounds of the place too. Like, yeah, uh, yeah, that would be awesome. Yeah. No, it's an amazing place, and I've had an absolute ball of a time over here um, it's been a real pleasure so yeah, it's been a great trip we've had some wild weather mm. we've seen it looking pretty in the sunshine we've mm. had rain and fog and yeah. uh, we've had big swells and rainbows and ocean spray coming up over the rocks and, yeah yep yeah. um, we've had amazing fish life yeah and uh, yeah plenty of challenges heaps of current and yeah. that's what this place is like it's yeah. kind of everything Jurassic Park for spearfishing yeah mm. yeah yeah, no, it's amazing. Um, so, with G Dream Destinations, um, you've been to Ascension Island, you've been um, Western Australia, Eastern Australia, you've been throughout the tropical islands. Um, Favourite place in the world to go spearfishing? <laughs> <laughs> oh, pretty much my backyard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. New Zealand's a special place in general. There's so much... Um, like, some people might complain about, oh, there's only, you know, 20-odd species or something to target. But um, cheap as there some the doesn't you know I don't know if you need 150 species to have a good time. Right. No, I don't. Like you know, everywhere is different, but um, 
and there's oh there's so many cool places to to dive in the world and see amazing things and mm. yeah there's lots of places I want to go but you know my favorite is at home mm-hmm. around around the New Zealand coast is yeah. awesome that's an amazing place yeah it's all about your goals on what you want to achieve for the day and mm. and um whether you're, if you're trying to achieve a world record and shoot a certain fish, like going to Ascension Island to target yellowfin tuna, mm. um, that was an amazing trip, but it, it wasn't fun. It mm. was work. It was hard. Yeah. You know, we dived nine days straight, and I shot that fish at five o'clock on the last day. We flew out the next morning like we were supposed to be out the water. We'd run out of time. Oh, wow. Yeah, and I'd been seasick the whole time. Oh. There was swell and stuff and diesel fumes from the boat and that I'd just been seasick the whole time looking at that sandy beach and on shore just dreaming of the day <laughs> I could sit on there. Instead <laughs> I was bobbing around in the ocean, you know, and we saw cool stuff. We saw amazing tuna and whale sharks and yeah. and I got to shoot my world record and, and land it, which was, you know. How big was that? It was 97.1 kilos. <sighs> Yeah, and it was it was dark. It was murky. There were sharks. It was yeah. It was trying, so and it was heavy. Oh, I just couldn't pull it up. It's more than two hundred pounds of fish. Yeah, swimming away from you. It, it was like thirty meters down at the end of my float line, swimming away, and I couldn't pull it up. And so, what do you do? You just got to find a way. So you know that was an awesome trip. I'm really proud of that world record, but it wasn't a fun trip. Mm-mm. You know, we're heading out in the bay at home. That's fun. Yeah. Yeah. To an extent, you know what you're going to find. To an extent. But the ocean always has these surprises in for you. Yeah. But, um, nah, cool. I'm going to wrap it up, but I wanted to ask you three maybe shorter sort of punchy questions. Um, for a person starting spearfishing, um, what's your number one bit of advice for them? Number one bit of advice is, you know, get set up with your gear. Just as long as it's a legal species to shoot, mm. shoot any fish and shoot it wherever you like. Don't mm. feel you have to shoot it in the head or that it has to be a certain thing, you know. I shot a Parori for my first fish and I shot it smack bang in the middle of the fillet and I was real happy and it yeah. still tasted good. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a good point. And I mean, that's what um, law enforcement officers get taught when they, you know, have to shoot a criminal or something too. It's central body mass. Yeah, don't feel up. pressured to do anything fancy. Just, yeah, yeah. just go out there and do the best that you can. Yeah, yeah. nice. I like it. Okay. Um, who's the single best person to go spearfishing with and why? Oh, Nat. <laughs> Nat's the best person because uh, we dive real well together and, and we don't even have to talk half the time. We kind of, we're on the same wavelength of what we're trying to achieve and yeah, yeah. and that. And, um, and it's really, really cool if I ever... On the rare occasions, I shoot something bigger or better than him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but now I like diving with that. All right, last question. Um, could you describe what um, the spearfishing experience means to you in yeah. one or two sentences? Spearfishing is adventure, and adventure is awesome. <laughs> it's a life well lived, I think, Rochelle. Yeah. Awesome. Well, um, fantastic to have you on the podcast. And like I said, um, um, I'm going to try and link up a whole bunch of the stuff at noobspirit.com forward slash Rochelle, R-O-C-H-E-L-E. And uh, people can come and have a look at some of your photography. I'll link up some social media and your YouTube channel, and uh, that'd be cool. But, awesome. Um, well, thanks for coming along. It's been oh, great having you guys here. Well, I can't even um, express how grateful I am for this trip. It's been absolutely amazing. And, yeah. Um, Still got a day left, really. We do. So, we do. Might awesome. be saving the best till last. <laughs> yeah. That, I don't know if we can get any better, to be honest. But <laughs> wow, it's been fantastic. So. Awesome. Did you enjoy today's episode? Mad chat with uh, Rochelle Potter. If so, I'd love to. Um, I'd love it if you left a review. Or even better yet, check out the Noob Spiro Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Noob Spiro and consider becoming a Patreon listener. This episode was uh, part two of three from my New Zealand trip recorded in March 2020. And a uh, massive thanks to Pat Dwyer and Impact Podcasting team for the podcast production. Check out all the show notes and pics from today's episode at noobspiro.com forward slash Rochelle. That's R-O-C-H-E-L-E. And I uh, hope you tune in for part three which was another multi-person chat over beers where we talk about the multi-day spearfishing trip uh, out to the Three Kings Islands, the Jurassic Park of spearfishing. Thanks for listening, guys.
This episode of the Noob Spirit Podcast is brought to you by spearfishing.com.au. May as well check out some gear while you're thinking about spearing and get an idea of what you want to buy later on down the track. Everyone's looking to upgrade something, whether it's your spear gun, your wetsuit, your float. It doesn't matter what it is, head over to spearfishing.com.au. Fantastic reviews from a whole bunch of people just like you. People that love spearing. If you like, head into the stores, Brisbane, Melbourne, Sydney or Perth. There's 70 passionate team members that can give you some help, getting some idea about what to buy next. But uh, the online shopping experience is fantastic too. And if you shop online, for every purchase over $200, if you use the code NoobSpero, you save $20. Thanks for supporting the Noob Spiro podcast and shopping with spearfishing.com.au.